So I want to start off with a question for you, and that is, what is the greatest challenge that we face over the next 50 years? Nobel laureate Dr. Richard Smalley, in a talk he gave in 2003, claimed that water was second only behind energy on a list of the top 10 challenges facing humanity over the next 50 years. Now, I would argue that we have made some progress towards the energy problem. We have substantial penetration of wind and solar into the markets. We have smart grids. We have electrical vehicles. And the list goes on. And we're not done. But I would argue that we are now on a positive trajectory. The question is, what about water? What about water? Well, the World Health Organization claims that by the year 2025, half of the world's population will be living in water-stressed areas. Half of them. I believe that if Richard Smalley were alive today, he would revise that list. And he would put water above energy because of where we're at today. We've made some progress, but we're not there yet. So with, with success, there are also problems that we have left to fix. So in the world today, there are conflicts associated with water. The Pacific Institute reports that water conflict has been on the rise in the last 20 years around the world. So with a finite supply of water and greater demand for water, Conditions are, the conditions are ripe for conflict associated with our water sources, such as rivers, lakes, and, and, and reservoirs across the country and around the world. So it is no secret that humans have been willing to kill each other since at least 2500 BC to gain access to water. And in places currently around the world, all of those places that have conflict are someplace other than here. The question is, how long will we ignore this problem before those conflicts come to the United States or even this hemisphere? So I want to tell you a little story about a about a hypothetical story, but completely believable, about a farmer named Jack. Jack's a farmer down in South Texas. Jack runs a family farm. Jack has kids. He has crops. He has cattle. Makes a living. In order to do that, Jack needs water. So in 30 years from now, Jack will be running his operation, and after years and decades of mismanagement, overconsumption, and undermanagement, the aquifer that supports Jack's operation and the surrounding areas will get too low, and Jack will have a choice to either redrill his well to a deeper depth or move. And then, the local municipalities may make the choice to start using surface water. When they do that, we have to remember that surface water usually has a dual purpose, and that is to cool our power plants. So now with a water problem, we have also an energy problem. Less water for Jack means less energy for Jack, 
means less pay for Jack. His standard of living goes down. He sends less product to market. Who suffers from that? The greater population. So you can see water will have an effect on all of us. And Jack's story is really our story. We could put a lot of names in Jack's place. And so we should start paying attention to the problem as we move forward and think about Jack. The causes of the water problem may seem simple, but the solutions probably don't. While demand has increased uh, proportional to a, to a rise in worldwide population of about 83 million uh, people per year, we have continued on the same track with what we're doing to manage our, our water. So we've really done very little to manage our water, even though the population is increasing. So what else hasn't changed? Well, hmm, we still have the same amount of water that we had 1,000 years ago, essentially. 0.3% of the, the world's water is available for us to use. We still need water. It's hard to believe that we would evolve ourselves out of needing water. That's not going to change. We still manage water the same way we did 50 years ago. Analog, no optimization, no rigorous means to reduce waste and increase efficiency. Most importantly, while water is the most highly valued, should be the most highly valued resource we have, it's also the least expensive. Highly undervalued resource. For instance, on your water bill, a thousand gallons of water is probably between five and ten dollars. If you leave this talk in a few minutes and go buy a thousand gallons worth of gasoline at today's prices, you will pay about $2,600. So the question is, why doesn't somebody do something? It seems like, you know, that's a great question. Why are we doing something? Well, I just answered that. The answer is money. There's really no financial incentive. Now, I'm not advocating that we go out and triple the cost of water tomorrow. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is we should potentially increase the amount of research and development dollars and intellectual capital to try to solve the problem. So the United States Environmental Protection Agency claims that there's about 151,000 um, uh, municipal water networks in the United States. 151,000, roughly. Let's assume for a second that each of them wastes about a million gallons a year. If we could reduce that, not get aggressive, just reduce that by 10%, that would be about 15 billion gallons a year that we're not wasting. The question is, how do we do that? Because really, I would say all the low-hanging fruit, all the easy solutions have been accomplished. We change our shower heads, our toilets for low flow. We're fixing our leaky pipes, our infrastructure. That's not what this talk's about. We, we now tell people when they can irrigate and when they can't. So we've done some things but still we're not there. So how do we get another 10%? How do we save 15 billion gallons, potentially? The answer lies not in infrastructure, but in evolution of ideas around how we manage our water systems. An evolution of ideas. So commercial sectors like renewable energy, automobiles, computers, you name it, they gain efficiencies in, their, in their, their processes 
by using technology. In recent years, due to robust support from uh, the Department of Energy, we've seen great strides in many of those sectors that I mentioned and others in terms of efficiency through the use of what they're calling smart manufacturing, which is a, 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 um, a way to gain synergy between big data, which we have, has become a big thing, storage of that data, modeling with that data, optimization and control all wrapped up together, operating in real time on a digital network. My proposal to you today is that we can apply and exploit that same technology to gain great efficiency in our water systems if we were only incentivized to do so. So there's a book. It's called Switch by Chip and Dan Heath. So in the book, Chip and Dan Heath is one of my favorite books, and I highly recommend it. Chip and Dan Heath talk about organizational change, affecting organizational change by starting at the individual behavioral level. You find one key behavioral modification, inspire people to do that, and the organization changes for the greater. In the book, they use the example of a, a region in Appalachia that was, that was plagued by childhood obesity. So the local leadership did not advocate for fad diets or extreme fitness routines, although that might have helped. They, they focused on one key behavioral change, one small thing that everybody can do and it does not cost them any money. That is when you go to the supermarket and you're going to buy milk anyway, instead of buying whole milk, you buy 1% milk. Small behavioral change. Obesity rates dropped in the region. Kids are now healthier. Success has been had not because of, not because of huge organizational change on the macro scale, but because behavioral changes. So, a new way to manage water is the key to greater efficiency, less waste, and ensuring that this resource is around for the long term. Friends, our 1% milk is the application of smart ideas to the management of our water systems, ensuring that we, we apply the same amount of capital, research, and policy that allowed us to change the trajectory of the energy problem providing a synergy between the data, the, the, the modeling, the optimization, and controls, process controls, all on a digital network in real time, ensuring that we manage the precious resource of water just like we manage the production of our cars, our computers, and even our Apache helicopters making sure that we save energy and water and potentially our society. Thank you.